Tom, good to see you, man. Great to see you. Thanks so much for coming on the show and congrats on the uh, the new single, which I was just listening to all day today. It sounds fantastic. Um, and oh, I, I, saw, I actually saw it on social media uh, before you sent it over. Okay. So, so, I, so I, I really loved it. Um, it's called All the Time in the World. And um, I'd encourage all of my listeners to go and check it out. It's on all the streaming services and on YouTube. But first of all... Um, what made you want to write a song called All the Time in the World? And it seems quite appropriate for the current, you know, situation we all find ourselves in, particularly in the US and the UK. I know, it's, it's disastrous. Um, well, actually, what happened was um, my son, Charlie, who's a great piano player, and he just graduated from, from USC, uh, the music school, the Thornton uh, School of Music. And... Um, He's a great, great piano player. He's a wonderful, with, with a lot of jazz influence. Uh, that's where his playing was based. And um, he also learned to engineer and record while he was there. And uh, he's become a remarkable engineer. So he was playing whenever he comes back to the house, because he has a, a place uh, down in Highland Park in LA. And when he comes back to the house, he'd go straight for our grand piano and start playing. And this piece that he started developing, Every time he played it, I thought, well, that's really super cool. I love it. And um, a few weeks ago, I just, had, I just asked him, will you play that piece once again so I can record it? So he played it, and I, I recorded it on my phone. And uh, as he was playing it, for some reason, what came into my head was all the time in the world. Um, it was actually the full line of, we may not have all this time in the world, but we got this day. And um, that's where it kind of went from and it kind of wrote itself um i have a lyric uh partner lyric writing partner rick otto who's a poet and an actor here in la and we've been doing a lot of stuff recently together and he's a wonderful writer and i told him the idea and he drafted some some things and sent them straight back to me that's the way we work you know i'll tell him an idea he'll stick them down and text them back to me uh so it's all very organic and very uh you know just like a little uh, factory, but it's very much a homey type thing. And so the lyrics he came back with, I re-edited them again and added a few more lyrics of my own, which um, the Joe Biden speech really uh, influenced this song. Uh, when he was talking about um, fighting for the soul of America beyond the presidential ticket. Um, that was his speech. And it really struck me as being right on the whole idea of that we are really fighting for the soul of this country. And, um, and that's where it happened. And it came together so quickly. I mean, the song was written in, in uh, you know, in a couple of hours, really. And then uh, I called my friend Adam Chester, who came over uh, socially distancing of course and and uh, i had him do a rough vocal on it and um he instantly said what a great song i love this song and uh so i said yeah i'm looking for like a gospel-y type chick to do this have you any ideas and he suggested vanessa uh vanessa bryan and vanessa was leaving for uh, alaska the next day so i called her and got her over to the house and had her sing on the, the song and she just nailed it. She yeah. totally nailed it. She's just a great, great singer. And, um, and then she and I uh, and Adam did some choir. You know, we built up a whole bunch of background tracks to sound like a choir. And I played, played the bass on it and we stuck a bit of tambourine on it and that was it. And then I put a couple of guitar fills, very, very minimalist. I mean, nothing, uh, there's nothing on yeah, the track, the which I think, yeah, I think that's the beauty of it. It's very basic. And the whole, uh, the whole point, you're drawn to the song, uh, the song itself and, and the lyrics. And, and if you've seen the video, you know, that, that just, yeah, it was again, great to that see was you guys working on it in the video. Yeah, it was so much fun to do. And again, I got a lot of, a lot of help from a company I'm working with right now called Alert the Globe. And they're a live streaming company. And they came, one of the guys, Ron Garrett, came, he's the, the brains behind the whole company. He came over to the house, couldn't believe the song, and just filmed it really fast uh, around what Charlie and I were doing. And um, so I called Vanessa, who was in Alaska, 
<laughs> not exactly next door. And I said, could you film yourself on your phone walking outside in, in Alaska and, and uh, we'll try and cut it all together? She did it and it was wonderful. And in fact, a lot of people thought it was a backdrop we were using of snow and winter wonderland and stuff. <laughs> this was, that was actually her outside our house in Alaska. Um, and it just worked perfectly. So it was probably the fastest video ever done also. Um, the guy from Alert the Globe, Jacob, cut it all together in less than a day. And lo, you know, lo and behold, we had a video and a song. And now it's up on iTunes. It went up last night. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's got it's got a great reaction to it um, because actually, as a way of uh, kind of preparing um, to talk about the song and and maybe if if you're you know because you mentioned before that you were working on quite a few things um, as a way of kind of setting up talking about this, I actually reached out to people. Um, I went onto Facebook and found uh, David Johnstone fans that they've got a group, and I I mentioned that we were doing the podcast. Um, and oh, I great. went on to an Elton group um, and I, I mentioned the, uh, that we were doing the podcast because I thought that they would be super stoked to hear the song if they hadn't already, because the Internet's so crowded with junk that, you know, sometimes things don't cut through. And the reaction has been everybody saying the song's beautiful. Um, and uh, and also I asked them, you know, do you guys have anything that you want me to ask Davey on the podcast? And the first thing that they said was, do you, so do you have plans to release more music after this? Because they say, you know, the, the Davy Johnstone band is like the best thing to come out of lockdown for them. So they, they were all pretty ah, stoked, I think. Um, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, we definitely have uh, many other things because um, Charlie and I, my son Charlie, who co-wrote all the time in the world, he, uh, he has been here a lot of the time during lockdown and everything. And we started recording in about July, you know, because I, I was writing a couple of things with Rick Otto and I was coming up with some really good stuff that I felt, wow, this is quite strong. And, you know, there's a beauty of being able to concentrate on my own stuff um, instead of, you know, just being Elton's guy and looking after the band and making sure everything was done and doing all these great concerts. And that's all wonderful. But this is the first time in probably in ever so that I've had chance to sit down and actually yeah. write some stuff for me and um and i've been really enjoying it and um so the david johnstone band is actually my son jesse who's playing drums on all the tracks uh, except one that nigel plays on uh there's a great track that oh, nigel awesome. uh, plays on yeah it's when that's been but apart from that it's all been my my family and uh so that's the david johnstone band and and we're going to start releasing more stuff uh in the new year uh we're already mixing it right now so it's probably going to be ready to go up sometime you know late january we'll start putting tracks up there uh, because you know the thing was i didn't really not knowing much about how the music business works these days, because it's all such a different animal than when yeah. I was, you know, really involved with it. Uh, it there's no time back then. Yeah, I think. The well, maybe. <laughs> well, I think I think you're probably right. But the thing is, it's forced me into learning about about iTunes and Spotify and these different platforms that you have to yeah. use these days in order to get yourself heard. I mean, that's what you have to do if you want to. Get about, and what I decided to do is put up on some of those social platforms, like my daughter put up on her Instagram, and uh, Tam released it on on his uh, nubs thing that he's got going, and also his page. So that's kind of what I wanted it to happen. I wanted it to happen naturally, where people would hear it, and if they liked it, they'd maybe inquire as to how they could how they could get a hold of it, and and because of the nature of the song and the message that's in within the song i really felt that it was important that people came to it on their own you know and actually really did like it yeah and and i incidentally it's it's great that you mentioned uh and i i really appreciate you reaching out to those fans and stuff because no, no, they're no, the no. ones they're the ones who really who really know and, and who really want to hear more from what i might be doing and i really appreciate that so thanks no 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 worries at all and the there's a huge load of fans who 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 wanna wanna hear it and are you know beyond excited and I knew it would be a great 
a great track, um, wh whatever it was. But, you know, the minute the piano came in, I was like, God, this is, you know, this is awesome. And I mean, he, it's he's funny. A, he's a very I, I got to tell you, there. he sure is. And funnily enough, uh, when Charlie was about 11 or 12, he's 22 now, uh, so 10 years ago, um, he was studying for a jazz festival that he was involved in at school. And um, it, the piece he was playing was, um, I think it was called Beautiful Love, a jazz piece, which is a great piece. And his teacher, Todd Cooper, had, had given them some new inversions and ideas. So I recorded it again with my phone. And it was so beautiful and so heartbreakingly beautiful that I sent it to Elton. Because I know Char, uh, Elton's always been a fan of Charlie's because he's, he's heard him since he started playing piano. And he's gone like, this, this guy's got it. He's going to be good. <laughs> so I, way back, I sent this thing to Elton. And he straight away got right back to me. And he said, my God, that's so incredible. And he said, it brought me to tears. And it was something else. And, yeah. and so after, when we wrote this song, I sent it to him as well, just like as a Christmas message and all the rest of it. And he got right back and said, oh, Charlie blows me away. And it's a beautiful song and a beautiful gift to the world, you know. So that was great to hear that back from him too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's funny how... Uh how he's uh, playing how he's playing piano and not not guitar like you but piano you know like uh, like your bandmate so well, i'm glad i'm glad he's doing that it means that you can collaborate with him uh, like this which is which is brilliant um yeah. another thing that recently came out on social media which was awesome um was uh, a little preview from pillars of hercules the documentary that was yes. also super exciting um, especially because it's talking about John Lennon, like yeah. I love John. Le I mean, who doesn't love John Lennon? But the Beatles hold a really special place in my heart, as they will for many listeners. So, yeah, um, for those listeners who don't know, you know, you, you were you were kind of talking about the night at Madison Square Garden, right? When when he joined you on stage, yes, right, and then Unbelievable. you guys started hanging out quite a lot after. Yes, well, actually, we hung out. Well, we hung out after that particular and before show, at Caribou. Well, we'd been together for since July of that year, and um, the concert was in Thanksgiving, so the end of November. And uh, yeah, I, it was just we all got on so well, and he came on tour with us quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So we became great friends, and um, I I play him music. I was into you know at that time in 1974, and Ry Cooter. And Al Green, which is a, one of my favorite albums of all time, the Call Me album. Uh, and they're all from 1974, you know. And uh, so we exchange stuff. And so I would turn him on to new stuff. And then in, 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 in return, he would tell me something about the way the Beatles recorded a track. Wow. So I was, get, I was getting to be a real groupie and, and ask him some great questions <laughs> I've always wondered about. So yeah, John and I became really close. And after that show, after that show at the garden, uh, Elton called me up. Uh, I don't know if I told you this on our last yeah, I think meeting. I, I think I remember that he, he called you up to hang out with him, right? Exactly. So John came over and, and we just spent the next six or seven hours having a lot of fun and playing music. And, you know, ironically, that's actually the last time I saw him because um, that was in 1974, December, well, in November, December. And um, we didn't actually come into contact. We didn't see each other. You know, we exchanged a couple of uh, things and letters and stuff. And when he was recording Double Fantasy, I was in New York in the summer of that year, and um, I sent a message to him to, via his people at the, at the studio, and I got a lovely message back from Yoko saying, yeah, we'd love to see you, but we're right in the middle of this thing, and, and I was leaving the next day, so it was like, no problem, love you guys, and see you around, not knowing that later that year he was going to be shot, so it was just... Um, Terrible, it means all yeah. the more to me, and I don't know if you know this, but the way this clip that you were talking about that, that Tam directed and put out um, from the Pillars of Hercules. Um, he called me just last week when I was doing um, another thing. I was doing a track for my friend, uh, David Page, 
of oh, total yeah. fame. I'm a huge Joseph wonder- fan. We've had oh, Steve man. Lukather and Joseph Williams on the podcast. They, they, they're great. They're just the best. Yeah. They're, the, they're the greatest. I mean, I love those guys and, and what amazing writers and musicians, you know. Super, and yeah. um, so, so I was doing this thing for David and Charlie and I are working away. Tam calls and says, I need a favor. And I'm going, okay, what? He says, well, can you recreate all your guitar parts and sitar stuff on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? Because I want to do a quick release of it. And it will save us asking Universal for the rights. And I was like, oh, shit. And I said, well, sure, why not? I'll do that. So we finished the David Page track, which he loved, by the way. It was great. David's a dear friend. And wow. then we went straight into, straight into recreating Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, our version from 1974. And it was amazing remembering these parts, which I remembered them all really well, because I, I do have a good musical memory for that stuff. I guess that's why I'm Elton's um, musical director, because I know I remember all the parts, you know. Yeah. And we, we recreated all those parts in, in a few hours. And then uh, myself, Charlie and Elliot, uh, the youngest of my clan, uh, we did the, the choruses. We sang the choruses. So Yeah, I, I was absolutely knocked out by that because I did read below. Because at first, first when I listened to it, I was like, oh, they used, used Lucy in the Sky Diamonds, like the Elton version. And I was like, wait a minute, like this documentary hasn't come out and they probably haven't, you know, like speaking to Universal and stuff about that stuff is a complete nightmare, I'm imagining. But it, <laughs> okay. I thought it was the real thing. But I mean, did, where did you record that at home and stuff? Next door. It just yeah. sounds like exactly, exactly the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I think nowadays because of all the great advances in technology especially in music plugins and stuff for recording stuff like that you can revert to sounds and rooms that you may have been in back then and it's just so amazing and as i said charlie my my wonderful piano playing engineer producing son uh, has got it down so well that we just we can do things we can do whole tracks and like the way i used to record stuff um you know you get the first pass, it's usually the best. And then you move on and do something else. And yeah, I've been really blessed that I can record so much from home during this home pandemic. And actually doing the Lucy track has made me realize that, you know what, for the documentary, I'm probably gonna end up doing a lot of that where I record yeah. it myself, you know, and- uh, I, I, I would honestly say like, it would, it would be, make the process so much easier um and and in terms of demand for the documentary i mean i think in a way that a lot of the audience for the documentary would kind of be more excited about like the music being done like that than just by using stuff that that you know anyone can kind of listen to on spotify or apple music or all the rest of it so i think you're right when it might come out like do do you guys know i mean presumably it's if you had to do that with the music you know it'd be quite a while till then well, I mean, we're right in the thick of things. Um, you know, I just, uh, a few days ago, I got um, Elton and David Furnish's blessing about going ahead with the documentary because, um, you know, I did put it on hold for six years. See, originally, uh, Annette Murray, who was Dee's first wife, uh, Annette and I came up with the idea of doing a documentary. It, originally, it was going to be to to bring some, you know, memory back about about D. Murray, because yeah. since he's been dead, I mean, the guy was a genius and, you know, a lot of people oh, don't even know that he passed. And yeah, and he's unbelievable. And he hasn't been given enough credit. So that was how we originally started it. And then we thought, well, let's make it about the band in those days and and what happened and the stories about the studio how we did tracks and and just stories surrounding that whole period so you know i put it on hold because of the farewell tour also because of the upcoming rocket man uh yeah. movie which was you know a year and a half or whatever ago and then elton's biography elton's book and um and it was entirely right that I should do that because I didn't want to get in the way of th- those projects. And, you know, if it's yeah. too convoluted, too diluted, you know, nothing does well. And um, so I did that and 
I taught, had a lovely conversation with David the other day in which uh, they were really happy to hear that I was going ahead and doing it again. Because honestly, I would never do anything, especially of a documentary nature about anything we did um, without them being OK with it. Um, yeah, yeah it would be because, difficult. you know, you know, there's always these exposés and sordid movies about this, that, and the next thing. This documentary is not about any of that. I think that's why a lot of the fans are going to love it because it's much yeah. more like a like a love letter to the fans, really, about what we did, you know. And um, about the and music. Elton knows that, yeah. And and uh, so yeah, so this whole documentary, we're in the throes right now of of putting together all the last things that we need. There's about two more interviews that we're looking to get. Um, and so we're probably going to be finished with all the recording of the, of the, the you know, all that, that stuff uh, by late January. Then we'll go into editing and hopefully we'd be ready around about, around about Easter. I'm thinking like late March, early oh, wow. summer, you know, that kind of time frame. But then we've got to do the, the big, you know, selling thing, sell it to whoever wants is interested in buying it. Netflix. And we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of it. Yeah. There's been a lot of interest uh, from various sources. So, you know, we'll do the best deal we can and, um, and then hopefully get it out there next year uh, by summer. I'm thinking it's going to be out by summer. Um, and there'll be also another couple of things that, that, um, that Elton's office are releasing to do with his career because they've seen, you know, just how, how valuable the documentary thing is and all this thing about live streaming and online that we've all had to do because of the, the pandemic. They've really seen yeah. the, you know, because you probably saw that thing about the amount of streams from Spotify, Elton, like 1.2 yeah, yeah, billion. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. yeah, it's been a real resurgence, you know. Yeah. When we first started to, go, me and my girlfriend, when we started to go to Elton gigs, like when we were at uni, maybe, and it was big stuff, you know. But it was like it was like that. Sometimes it wouldn't be that unusual to go to a gig where it was like ten thousand, twelve thousand capacity, which is still huge. But then now it's exploded to back to like kind of what you'd expect in the seventies, like exactly, 50, yeah, fifty thousand stadiums type of things. So it's been a huge resurgence and. Spotify, play, the Spotify plays seem to be like kind of charting younger artists. I don't know whether it's the yes. tour, the movie, the book, whatever. But yeah. um, but for, I, I don't really like care how, how popular it is. Like I love, I just love the music. I think the band is, is, is the thing that makes it though. You, you know, you guys together as a unit to see you guys playing um, together after so long, like it's pretty rare in the music business, isn't it? Like what other bands, I mean, other than the Stones, have been going this long. I don't think there are any. I don't think there are any. Yeah. Uh, the, the only other bands that are still out there um, usually might have one original member and all the rest is like, just so they can go on tour, you know? Yeah. Um, but I mean, no, I, I don't know. I don't know of any other bands apart from the Stones, as you say, um, that are still doing it. And uh, especially not at the level we're doing at. I mean, no. you know, which is wonderful. We're all very grateful that we can do that. And hopefully we can get back on the road and, and finish this farewell tour. We're all planning on it. I mean, I just, I talk to Elton every week and, you know, we're planning on doing it. So, you know, hopefully this vaccine, and I can't stress enough though, that if, if only people would, would be, would finally listen, you know, to the health concerns that have been there from the very start, you know, wear a fucking mask and just, you know, do the right thing. Don't breathe all over people. Don't go to these giant rallies like some people <laughs> will tell you to do. And it's just an insanity. And I'm really hoping that all this crap will be over soon, that we can actually have a dignified and, and a really nice, you know, uh, nice relationship with other people in this country because yeah. i didn't become i didn't become a u.s citizen this year in fact i didn't become a u.s citizen to have to be dealing with this kind of stuff and and uh most people i know who are staunch who you know who've grown up in this country have said this is not the country i grew up in this yeah. is not it at all so you know everybody wants a bit of sanity back here and hopefully the mass hysteria that's 
taken on, you know, like in Hitler dimensions, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> when that's when that gets put to bed, maybe there'll be some sanity we'll get back. And, and uh, that's what we're all praying for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, things, fingers crossed. I mean, I think it's so bad. It's so bad to see society so polarized by by what's going on. Um, and it's and it's made all the worse by lockdown, by people being stuck indoors on social media and stuff. You're not a big user of social media, are you? Are you? I, I always think that's no. A I don't. Thing, to be honest, I don't. I don't do any of it. I um. I know there's a there's a Facebook page that I think uh, Tam handles um, occasionally when he has time. Um, my daughter does my Instagram page. I don't do any of that stuff because <laughs> I, I just don't do it. I decided very early on in the in the game. Well, this is not what I want to do. And plus, I just don't have time. I just physically do not have time to do that. Um, so once in a while, I'll answer something. And, 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 you know, don't get me wrong. I'm incredibly grateful that people do go to some of these sites and, and you know, pages and, and say nice things. And, and I always do, oh, yeah, do sure. my best to, to thank them for it. But it's, um, it's just something that I, I've, I know that Elton's the same way. He's, just, you know. He very rarely, he's now, you know, doing a bit of Instagram stuff here and there that he will actually answer a lot of things, which is fantastic. And it's entirely correct that he should do that. Um, just something that I've never been a fan of. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think it's a massive drain on time, in, in, in all honesty. And also, it is the kind of vehicle for all of this nonsense that's going, you know, all of this horrible aggression and people... Um, not managing to find eye to eye so hopefully that will be put to bed and you guys will be able to go on the road next year so I've got a few uh few questions like obviously you know from from the fans who who got in touch uh, first of all for people who um are you know guitarists or you know gu guitar players and guitar fans um somebody wanted to know what amps you were using during the early 70s um period <laughs> ah okay well um I used my earliest recollection. Um, I used a, a Vox AC30, which is a brilliant amp. It's the amp that the Beatles used mainly. And it's the amp that the Shadows used. Hank Marvin was one of my first guitar heroes. So that's for you, guitar. Uh, so <laughs> that was one of my main amps back then. The other one that I used uh, was a Fender uh, Deluxe Reverb which is another great amp if you really know how to use it. I mean, I never used much of the reverb connotation on it. I just used it for the sound it would have. In fact, I used to max uh, everything on 11. And I'd get this again from Fender. Uh, they made a tiny little, it was essentially uh, originally for kind of a practice amp, very small, literally about this size, uh, called a Fender Champ. And nobody really took them seriously. But I heard John Lennon use one, um, and he used it on Revolution on the Beatles White album. And I, I was like, what a great sound. That is hell. The distortion on it is so, you know, nasty. And mm -hmm. so I decided to try that on Saturday Night's so Right for Fighting. So that became a, uh, that was in 73 we recorded that. So it became like a, a real part of my arsenal that I would use, I would go to that occasion. And Getting smaller still, I used to use, uh, Gus Dudgeon bought me a, a gift that he heard in America one time when uh, back in the early 70s called a pig nose, a pig nose amp. And again, this was a really small. I'm going like this size, like that. Wow. Uh, and uh, one little speaker in it and uh, it came in a great, um, it had a little pig's nose for the volume, just one volume thing on the front. That was it, no tone control. Um, two inputs on the back and um and that was it and we actually used that a lot uh, on albums i used that on things like um tracks like grimsby from uh caribou i used it on uh, curtains it's a really mammoth guitar sound that sounds like 50 marshals wired up together that's one pig nose <laughs> and those are the kinds of effects you can get if you're working with somebody like Gus Dudgeon and these great engineers who know how to get, you know, how to mic these things up and get the best possible, you know, just, just make them sound the way they should, you know. So yeah. um, apart from that, the only big amps 
in those days. I, I used an amp by Ted Wallace, who was a London-based amp builder. Uh, great amps. I used them on a couple of tours. And then in the mid-70s, I was given uh, a Mesa, Mesa Boogie amp to try out. They sent one up to Caribou Ranch when I was up there recording. And it just, nobody had heard of them. And it was a beautiful looking amp. And I was immediately in love with it because it was all the things I loved, you know, that I could get out of an amp. Amazing. And um, so I started using them for the next four or five years and on and on and on. Wow. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that sound on, on Saturday nights were right for fighting, you know, that's got it kind of like, I mean, among among um, some some other kind of bands and and influences, you know, that song's kind of been credited as as one of the early like heavy metal tunes um, by some know. people, which is pretty interesting from from you know you guys because the, the material's yeah. pr- quite varied. Not all of it, certainly not all of it, is is heavy metal. Um, <laughs> one thing that I was interested that we didn't cover um, last time actually was, you know, you actually only switched to electric guitar um when when you joined the band is that is that right like on on the honky cat record and before that because you were playing in magna carta um so so your kind of learning of guitar was all on acoustic instruments and other instruments like mandolin um when when did you start um playing music like originally and when when did you first like pick it up what guitar in general oh um my sister bought me a guitar when i was 11 because she knew, that, I mean, she just knew that I was completely mad on music and I always wanted a guitar. And, um, and she bought me this acoustic guitar and, and it wasn't very good, but it was exactly what I needed just to, you know. Uh, and I, within like a week, I was playing crazy shit on it. So, I mean, <laughs> I was obviously meant to play guitar, you know. Um, but then when I got to be 12 and a half or something, um, my dad helped me buy my first electric guitar, which was called a Broadway that nobody's heard of before or since. And um, it was a very, you know, affordable uh, electric guitar, the kind of guitar that that somebody would buy for their kid if they thought, well, this is going to be a passing phase. And maybe if I just get it, hmm. you know, you, you know, unfortunately for them, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> and, and I was asked to join by six months later, I was asked to join this band of 21 year olds who were all playing, you know, like in big stages and youth clubs and stuff. And they had big amps and everything. And they wanted me to join their band. I was like 13 and basically, you know, they said, no, we really want you to join the band. And I said, well, if I join the band, can I get one of those amps? And they went, sure, yeah, definitely. Joined the band, was with them for like a year. We played a bunch of uh, youth club things and different things in Glasgow where I was terrified of getting beaten up and bottled by various people because <laughs> Glasgow on a, on, a, on a Friday or a Saturday night was a recipe for a fight every time, you know, and uh, God bless him. I do love my Glasgow friends and stuff, but it's true. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, that's kind of how it started. So I did play electric before that. And then uh, later yeah. when I played acoustic, um, Certainly not proficiently, though. I didn't know much about it. I just, you know, pick out tunes and you had to play electric guitar. Mm-hmm. But so later, when I was when I was with Magna Carta, we wanted to have electric on a, on one or two songs on the album. So rather than getting somebody, a session player, to do it, I just said, well, I'll do it. So, you know, I wanted to get a Stratocaster. Anyway, I wanted to have one and, and part of my thing so i bought one down in charing cross road where everybody used to go on a saturday morning and try guitars and stuff and i bought one and um you know played on stage a couple of tracks but again i wasn't it wasn't my main thing but i i wasn't proficient um i think i had a fuzz box that i would love playing and and somebody gave me a wah-wah pedal so i i knew a little bit about it but it's part of the myth that uh, part of the story that Elton likes to say that I never played electric before. Yeah, you know, yeah. So it is, it's band. a real myth. <laughs> it is. A, it myth, is a myth. Though. It's a great myth because I mean I did do a session for for Magna Carta before I had my second electric guitar, and I borrowed one from uh, Peter Knight, who's a um, Steel Ice Span 
fiddle player. And um, I borrowed this archaic guitar with not really a proper amp. It was just like a platform, a wooden platform with a speaker and a couple of tubes on it. And it was just the scariest looking thing. And I took it to the studio and I remember all the other musicians going, you know, what the fuck is that? It must be really cool. You know, they thought that I was some mad professor. And it was, it was like a, a radio that I'd borrowed from somebody, but you know, you do what you can, you use what you can. I've always been a believer of that. What's available. That's what you use, you know? Yeah. And, and w when you, when you were picking up music, like from what, from what I've read or heard, I don't know where, where I've got this, but from what I know uh, vaguely that you've, you, you know, you're kind of classically trained in the sense that you can read music, right? I mean, you wouldn't, you, you would have to kind of to, to be the music musical director. Um, when did you pick up th those type of skills? Was that um, kind of before moving well, to I, London and stuff? Oh yeah, that was early days. That was um, way back when I was seven years old because um, somebody came around our classroom when I was in seven years old. So I'm, I'm you know, a little tiny kid in Scotland. And the question was, hands up if you want to play violin. And for some reason, my hand went up like that. I don't remember putting up my hand, but my hand, I think it was maybe some kind of a God shot. <laughs> and, um, you know, and they said, fine. I was the only one in the class, so fine. Report to the, this on Friday and you'll start your violin lessons. So I started um, reading music and playing violin. Um, at a very early age, at the age of seven. And I yeah. progressed to playing in uh, schools, orchestras. Um, but my heart wasn't, wasn't in it. I didn't like the, the classical, uh, the orchestral thing. I love orchestras, don't get me wrong, but it just wasn't what I was. I didn't yeah. like the idea of sitting with 30 other people, you know, and some guy shouting at you because you were playing the wrong fucking note. So it, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't music to me as such. It was more like you will play this or you will be punished. You know, it was like, ah. Oh. So I started playing the violin like, like this. And um, that's when my sister bought me the, the guitar. But, you know, so I kept some of the skills. Um, I'm not proficient reader anymore of music. But it did definitely help me even up to the early days of working with Elton because when I did those early sessions with him and with yeah. other artists, uh, when I was a young session player, you had to read music, you know, because Buckmaster would come in with a chart. It was like, wow, you know, shit. So, you know, you had to, you have to, you have to have some basic sight reading skills in order to do that kind of work. Uh, and it, that's kind of carried me through in many ways. But quite honestly, I don't use any those skills much anymore you know if i need to work actually working with a conductor or a choir master and you know they have that job to do i'll just basically show them where where this is where the chart should should move here and there yeah yeah that that's really interesting and um yeah that i find that really fascinating in the sense of how many kind of people in in a similar position to, to yours you know like really top flight like act and and you're the musical director um would read music is that that common in in pop and in rock music because like jeff lynn i heard doesn't read and like there are a bunch of other examples which all have <laughs> escaped my mind but like paul mccartney the other day was just saying like sheet music is just oh, yeah. like dots on a page to me like i don't understand any of it so so right. is, is is it that needed to play like rock and roll and pop um, and these type of styles? Um, in certain areas, it depends what your basic thrust is going to be in the world of music. For me, it was important because I wanted to play with a lot of different artists. Uh, yeah. It was also by, you know, I wanted to make a living as a musician. So it was important to me if I showed up at a session that I was working and I was working with an artist and they had a, a they had music they wanted to play. It was important that I knew some of that. And ironically, on one of the sessions I did for, um, I don't know if you won't remember, but there was a folk singer uh, called uh, Julie Felix. And she used to work. She was on David Frost's weekly show. And she was quite a big deal back in the late 60s, early 70s. And I was brought in to play on one of her tracks. And John Paul Jones was producing it. Wow. And it, and it was a chart. And so people like John Paul Jones, Jimmy Page, 
they come from that school of doing a lot of studio work. So they would, they know, they know how to read music. Um, for example, all the Toto guys that we talked about earlier, proficient, you oh, know, yeah. school of music guys, they all top class readers, you know. They, they were studio players first in, in the sense of you guys had had one, you know, massive gig. Um, I mean, obviously you went on to work with loads of other people, but when you first started, you know, you must have been so busy. It would must have been quite impossible to, to work on anything else. But that, and so you kind of had that first, right, before then working with loads of other people, or is my timeline slightly but, botched there? <laughs> no, 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 you're, you're right. But I, I, I was able to actually keep up doing studio work, you know, not as much time. as I would have. Yeah, I just, wow. you know, I, it was like became something that I enjoyed doing. And again, because I met, I met uh, Steve and David Page, uh, you know, Steve Lukather, David Page, uh, Steve Picaro, Jeff Picaro, all these guys, because they were all top session guys. So yeah, I was I would be doing a session and I would go in and do a session with like Richard Perry as producing and for somebody and. I'd walk in and, and there'd be Jeff behind the drums and, and um, you know, Bob Glob from, from Linda Ronstadt's band on bass and Waddy maybe playing guitar or another one. There, there was, this is how you, there was a camaraderie about it that was really fun. Yeah. Um, and so it became something I enjoyed doing. I think if you didn't have, if you didn't read music or at least have an understanding uh, of some of that stuff then you were very limited in what you could play on uh, yeah. so i i kept it up for that reason that i enjoyed playing on on other people's stuff and yeah I, you're right though i mean for rock and roll essentially i mean if you're the stones for example so much of that is by feel yeah you know, i mean i love the stones i i really love them um but their stuff is so much feel and just the way they put things together it just is so clever uh, and so unpretentious and not contrived and all these great words that you can you know describe with a lot of rock and roll acts um, so it doesn't really need to be notated you know yeah but I, I bet you I bet you all, all their songbooks and all the rest of it they'd have to it'd hire be, somebody straight away to down yeah 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 so actually so I got to tell you something last night for some reason, I started playing some a uh, track. Um, I, this song has no title, which is from Yellow Brick Road. Um, oh, yeah. And it's one of those songs that doesn't really get heard very much. But I was just sitting, I was picking, I was doing some kind of fast guitar picking on my acoustic. And I suddenly thought, oh, that'd be good for this song has no title. And I was just with one acoustic guitar. So I'm thinking of doing a version of that. But the thing is, when I... By the time when I got to the chorus of it, there was one chord that el eluded me. And I was like, what is that chord? I don't get it. Because the thing is, I didn't play on that track. The only thing I did on that track was I worked Elton's wah wah pedal because he didn't know how to do that. So when he knew there was a track where he played one of the keyboards through a wah, and I worked the pedal while he was doing it with my foot. <laughs> so so I didn't actually play the part of that song. So I didn't know what that chord was. So as I'm playing it last night, I'm going, shit, I can't get that chord. So I had to download it <laughs> from the internet to, to find out what the chord was. To figure so, out what that chord was. That's, that's yeah. amazing. That's such a great track as well. That album oh, is, I love it. yeah, it is one of the best. For me, that is one of the best albums, if not the best album yeah. of all time. So, so, so amazing. So uh, what, one thing... Um, about reading and, and, and that level of sophistication, I guess, is when you bring up the stones, like their chord structures are pretty, they're not like simple, it's not simple music and to have the feel to play it, but but it is Elt Elton um, John music is kind of more like, it's quite involved for a guitar player, isn't it? Particularly, because like E flats and B flats and all, is that harder to play on guitar than, than on piano? I know on piano, it's quite straightforward, obviously, to play those type of chords. Um, and, right, and the chords in general are a bit bit more involved. So I guess for your role to have your education must have been pretty crucial, especially in the early oh, days, right? Definitely, definitely. I mean, because you can't keep. I mean, a lot of guitar players tend to say, "Oh, well, I'll just put a capo on this, so I don't have to play." Like you're saying, E flat, B flat, you know, A flat minor, G flat, you know, um, P 
piano players, it comes natural, especially somebody like Elton. Um, he writes a song in a specific key that will be good for the song. It feels right for him vocally, but it also feels right for the song. Um, so I would have to straight straight away. Plus, it's not very cool, I don't think, to have a capo on your guitar, you know, especially <laughs> if you're playing live. You're like somebody like, oh, fucking hell, he's not much cop if he's having to use a capo. So yeah. I decided to, to learn all the stuff, you know, like that, you know. And uh, so it definitely actually helped my playing in many ways because I was forced to really, you know, know the, the neck of my guitar even better than yeah. I already did. And, uh, and yeah, it's, I mean, I know I've shared this before and, and people have asked me about, about, you know, some of Elton's songs, but Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, for example, is such a complex structure, yeah. uh, chord, chordally. I mean, you're literally, you're, you're changing chord, you know, every half bar, you know, yeah. uh, or every bar, in, 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 which is a lot for any rock and roll type bass song it doesn't happen really it's unless it's a c f g any song yeah yeah it's just ridiculous and then the cor the chorus is a different whole different key than the verse and and it all goes back and you know so yeah the songs are a lot more songs like that are a lot more uh, difficult even something like saturday nights are right for fighting you know i've had to show a couple of seasoned guitar players what they'll say well what's that chord there because that's not even though it's a ballsy rock and roll tune there's a lot of stuff in there that that most guitarists would go what what is that you know so again i think it's all down to you finding things that people will enjoy when they hear it and other guitar players will be able to pick it out but not always there'll be something in there that will be like oh they'll never get that and and, and in many ways i would stick something in for that reason you know, yeah. I'd know that, well, some, nobody's going to know exactly how I did that. And I've seen a couple of those sites where they say, um, you know, those things where somebody will say, this is how you play Rocket Man. And, yeah. you know, so I actually went on that the other day and it was so fucking wrong. I could not believe it. <laughs> I was laughing so hard. And, and while this guy was explaining and trying to go, this is what it is, and you know. And I'm going, no, that's not it. I was like shouting back at the screen, you know, going, that's not it at all. You don't have it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, I, think, uh, I think a lot of them are wrong. Because <laughs> during lockdown, I learned, uh, learned how to play piano. And it was like, the, wow. the, all the chords, I mean, I'm still, I'm still shit. But, you know, it was something to pass the time. But uh, on all the Elton tunes, it was all like, you know, all the chords, not all, but pretty much every song would at least have one or two wrong chords just by ear. And it's just quite... Um, yeah, quite bizarre that these guys like, I mean, there are, there are some very good ones on, on the internet with education, but we're talking about the Toto guys who are so, you know, talented and know how to read and all that stuff. Right. Um, they, that band was really, and David Page, um, they were very influenced by what you guys were doing, weren't they? Um, big Elton fans and big fans of you guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I'll never forget. Uh, Jeff Picaro was saying to me, we were in the studio doing something. I don't, know, don't even remember what it was, of course, but we were chatting. And I do miss Jeffrey, by the way, one of the greatest drummers of all time. Yeah. And, he, and, and we were chatting about something. And I'd heard that they were going into the studio. This is before the band had a name or anything. And, uh, and I said, so how's it going? He said, oh, man, we're so enjoying it. He said, our guitar sounds are sounding like what you do. You know, when you have layered uh, sounds and that really tight distortion. Uh, and he said, it, it's sounding like you guys are doing. And I thought that was so sweet that he said that. Um, yeah. But no, those, it's just, I mean, they were big fans. And, you know, they've played on a bunch of Elton things. I mean, David played on a bunch of tracks um, on the Fox and maybe a couple of other things. And, and so did Steve. Steve played on a couple of tracks. Um, you know, Jeff Beccaro played on a couple of things uh, right up to, I think, Jump Up. So there's been people, you know, those guys have come and gone. You know, if yeah. I haven't been around, where Elton Hughes, other people, and you know, it's all like a big club. We're all, we're all each other's biggest fans, really. You know, we're all like professional uh, mutual admi admirers. And uh, 
It's, it's interesting on that subject, though. I was talking to another dear friend of mine, and I promise you, I'm not name dropping. I was talking to my friend Eddie Vedder, who's a dear friend of mine, and um, oh, yeah. we we're talking about music in general. And he was so excited to tell me he's got this new music system in his house, and he said, "You will not believe the way this thing sounds." He said, "It's right back to the way you should listen to music. It's the way that." you guys recorded and I said, well, specifically what are you talking about? And he said, well, the best album ever, there's no question about it, the sounds, the best sounding record with the most space around it is Captain Fantastic. And I'm going, really? He's going, yeah, and I'm talking about, you know, this is Beatle albums, whatever, every album you hear, Captain Fantastic is up here, number one, number two goes down here somewhere. He said, I swear <laughs> to God. So he was telling me about the space between, because if you remember, if you think about it, there was nothing on those albums. There's myself, D, Nigel, Elton, and Ray Cooper. Yeah. And, and that was it. So there is ultimately, you can hear each part so well on those tracks. And, and the songs are so, I don't know, there's, they're, they're really, um, they're quite emotional in many ways and quite moving. And there's hardly any singles. It's amazing work, the whole thing. But it was so nice to hear Eddie saying that. And I'm I'm thinking of trying to do a version of one of his favorites of Someone Saved My Life Tonight and get Eddie to, to do it. Because that would um, be awesome. That, that's yeah, such a great uh, band. He's yeah, he's, uh, he's such a great he's so artist. great. And 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 this is what happens when people um who have come up maybe 15 20 years even after us they mention us as being some of their main inspirations and that means a lot to me when i hear that i mean there's so many of the guys that know all these songs and it's like really <laughs> like, yeah. so i get I, okay makes sense i guess now when i think about it and it's from great. different genres and like because i saw um years back when we i think we we had been in vegas we were following the Vegas show anyway. And uh, there was and Metallica, one of my favorite bands. Like I've been to see Metallica, I don't know, five, six times, a lot of times anyway. Oh, right. And then I saw like awesome. Kirk Hammett was playing with you guys. And it's just, <laughs> that's so awesome that, that he would yeah. be a fan of, of, of your guys' band. But I can see, you know, Saturday and Bitches Back and that stuff, you know, that would be so influential because that was pretty groundbreaking yeah. back, back then. You know, that was early yes. 70s. Yeah, I mean, I I would must admit, I the same way when it started, be, when it became apparent that bands like Metallica and uh, people like that, because uh, I mean, I remember Elton calling me from Hawaii. I was due to go over there in a week. We were playing a couple of gigs at the the stadium there, and um, Elton said, "Listen, I'm sitting here with Kirk Hammett, and and I'm going, oh yeah, Metallica." Are you kidding? And he's going, no, he really fucking loves you, you know, what you've done. And so I'm going like, wow. He said, anyway, he's going to be in Hawaii and, and he wants to meet you at the gig when you play there. And I was like, great. So, you know, he came along and actually Eddie was at that gig also because they were all in Hawaii at that time too. And so we all met up and and uh, became very friendly and, and uh, it just shrinks the musical world even more when you realize that there are more people you know, who are willing to, to share their stuff with other players. I mean, when, when Kirk got up with us in Vegas, I mean, he was going to be in Vegas and sent me a text and saying, look, I really would like to get up on Saturday night in Vegas. And I'm going like, well, OK, but I'll have to ask Elton because we don't have any guests on this show at all. There's no people gets up, you know, and nobody has gotten up on that show. Yeah. And so I asked Elton, he said, sure, why not? So <laughs> Kirk came along that Saturday afternoon, did his own sound check on our stage. And I came up there, you know, uh, to say hi to him. We had a big hug, set up my amp next to his. And we ran through it a couple of times and he did it that night. And it was fucking so much fun. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a great thing when musicians from different areas and different genres all get together and um, there's no reason why they can't play on each other's stuff. In fact, yeah, I know Elton did a thing last week that Kurt was involved in. So look out for that coming up too. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. Uh, that 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 would be awesome. Whatever whatever it is, it sounds awesome anyway. So I've got one final question for you, Davey. Um, and yeah. you know, as as and when you know you've got music uh, to come out, um, we'd be delighted to support it um, because you know on this podcast we are huge. Uh, fans of of you guys and 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 what you do um so but one final question is and and you know that i'm a big fan of nigel um and he and he and you know he's a friend and he's an he's such a great guy so like i do prefer i have a loyalty towards you know the the, the kind of core elton band as i see it like you Got it. Dave, um nigel however i was listening to blue moves um i had listened to it before obviously but giving it like a proper listen and i have to say despite um nigel's absence from it which is you know a, a minus point um it is such a great album do you think it's slightly underrated and do, do you have kind of good memories of making that because there are some amazing tracks like cage the songbird what i mean it's just incredible yeah it, it was a it was a very fun project to to, to do uh, being that it was done in Toronto in the, in January, February, March, it was fucking cold. I couldn't believe how cold it was up there. Uh, mm. But yeah, it was a lot of fun to do. And it, we'd made one album prior to that, Rock of the Westies, with that band, with that, uh, with that um, lineup. And so it was a lot of fun to do. Those albums were dif very different to record because, see, I realized that because Elton wanted to have a bigger band, and obviously I'd have to be very much part in, in getting that band together and sorting it out. Um, but he wanted to have a bigger band. So what happens in that situation is that automatically you must therefore shrink your contribution down to make room for somebody else's. Yeah. And that I, I would always do that as a musician anyway, because that's the way I think. I don't think in terms of, oh, I'm going to muscle somebody else out of the way and get to the front of this and because that's not what I do. Um, but it did shrink my contribution to a certain extent, or I would lay back a little bit in order to let Caleb shine on a track and he would lay back a little bit to let me shine, this kind of thing. Uh, I ended up playing more mandolin. Um, you know, we just do something where we all had a bit more space, but it was a lot of fun to do. And um, I know Ray really enjoyed that album as well because he was able to really shine on some of the rock tracks on his percussion and and tambourine stuff. Awesome. And, and Roger Pope, um, God bless him, no longer with us, but Roger was a, an entirely different player from Nigel. There's only one Nigel. There's only yeah. one Nigel. And uh, Roger Pope was what, a great drummer as well. Great he's, player. Uh, he's, Nigel, a great, you know, he's, yeah. he's one of the best, best drummers, you know, I think for that kind of feel style of playing, like kind of similar to, to Ringo. Um, of course, he would he would like that uh, comparison, I'm sure, because he's a big fan of Ringo's. And uh, yeah, in fact, they're, they're, they're my they're actually my two favorite drummers, uh, you know, in in rock music. And when you listen to any any Beatle album, I mean, that's what I listen to, and I I just listen to the way Ringo arranges stuff on the records and uh, the way that he played influenced everybody. And Nigel's yeah. the same way. This Nigel to play with Nigel on a basic, uh, on all those Elton tracks, Nigel and I would basically play together um, on those basic tracks. That's what made the tracks really work because we were listening to each other. You know, we'd all be listening. The four of us would all listen to each other, which is really the way music's got to be. And essentially it's the way that the Beatles always recorded. That's really all their best stuff was them in the studio listening to one another and coming up with these ideas accordingly. And um, that, that's music to me, that's music at its best, no question about it. And that's why that track I mentioned to you uh, at the beginning of this, this podcast was um, the song, there's a song called Melting Snow, which I wrote, um, I wrote it basically on my own, but with my friend Rick Otto, who came up with some great lines on it, uh, no question. And my son Elliot's doing all the lead vocals on it, which is unbelievable. And um, well, we and I asked hear. Nigel, I asked Nigel to play on it because as I'm writing, I'm going, there's really only one guy who could play on this track. There's only one guy that I want to, I want to play on this track, and that's Nigel. And I know how super careful he has to be, you know. Um, because we're all getting up there in age, you know. Yeah. I mean, Nigel's 73, you know, this, 
I believe he, when I think it's February. Yeah. Or maybe he's going to be 74. Anyway, he's up there. Yeah. I'm going to be 70 next May. So we're all getting old. We have to be very careful. But I, I, I said to him, look, Nige, if you feel like it, it would be totally safe. There'd be nobody else around. I'd love you to play on this song. And he said, sure, I'll do it. And he showed up with his mask, with a pair of drumsticks. I <laughs> set him up in the, the corner of this room. Drum kit all set up for him, all mic'd up. And he played on this one song. He was only there for an hour. He came in, you know, we had a good laugh. Uh, he played on the track, done, and he left. And um, when I hear now what the way he played, I, I wasn't surprised because it was exactly what I thought he'd do. But he said, I'll play on one condition. You have to play along with me like we did in the early days. And I said, you got it. Absolutely. Wow. That's so cool. So we, yeah. So we did it that way. And um, it's pretty awesome, the result. Yeah, I can't, can't wait to hear that. Um, yeah. Davey, thank you so much for taking the time to do this podcast. I really, really appreciate it. And I, I know I speak for many people when I say I appreciate the new music. All the time in the world is out now to all my listeners please check it out and uh yeah i'm i'm looking forward to, to hearing more music and getting pretty excited about the documentary too so yeah in, in the meantime have a very happy christmas by the way yeah you too tom and, and listen it's always a pleasure talking to you um you know so much about what we've done and, and about music in general and it's always a pleasure okay so oh, give my much, love to, give my love to all your fans as well and, and stay safe okay Thanks, David. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.